Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at Disparities and Inequities in Youth Sports in Lincoln. We're really excited to share some new information with you and also for you to hear from three individuals, all who bring a different perspective to this important issue. You know, youth sports is so deeply embedded in Lincoln's cultures. Um, and, and we can drive anywhere in Lincoln on any evening right now, and, and the fields are full, the gyms are full. We see kids out active. Um, youth and, and teens enjoying uh, all that youth sports has to offer here in Lincoln. And we celebrate this. We should do that. But there are some worrisome trends that we want to examine today. There are certainly barriers for some youth to participate in sports, and those may be things like cost or transportation <coughs> or travel to club sports or family support. It could be a lot of things. And with those barriers, we believe there are lost opportunities. There are lost opportunities for things like the skills of teamwork and discipline and goal setting. And really one of the things that we believe is a, is a lost opportunity is, the, is for youth to be able to network with their peers across the community on these teams, with parents across the community, with coaches from across the community, and to really be able to explore the physical attributes that would lead them not only to that ability to network in a wider way, but also to improve their physical health. It also leads us to things like lost opportunities perhaps in, in high school sports or in college sports. Scholarships may be lost because of these barriers. So this is an important topic for us to think about um, in our community today. I want to share with you a map that we have um, from, from uh, data from the Lincoln Public Schools and from the Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln. This map shows us where in Lincoln children, um, how children are doing with the PACER test. The PACER test is really an indicator of aerobic fitness in our children today. It is the test that the Lincoln Public Schools use to decide how aerobically fit our children are in Lincoln. And this map will tell us in the oranges and the reds and the yellows that there are some concerns where kids are not able to pass the PACER test at what we consider to be an acceptable level. So we know that certainly um, the opportunity for youth sports can play into things like this to a lower level of aerobic fitness. We also know that aerobic fitness um, and especially the PACER tests are directly related to influencing grades things like reading and writing and mathematics and science. So we want to give kids every opportunity to be able to participate in these sports and this activity. We know that income plays into this. In fact, data tells us that U.S. children from households with incomes greater than $100,000 will participate in sports, and that's just any sports, not club sports even, but sports at almost twice the rate as those from households with incomes less than 25,000 or those who are living in poverty in Lincoln. So this is certainly something we need to think about, we need to talk about, and we have three great people um, to do that today. Before we start um, with this group, I wanna remind you that if you have questions along the way, feel free to put those in the chat and we will address as many questions as we can um, at the end of our time together. So I first want to start off by introducing Steve Dosky. You know, our first question is, what does the data say about Lincoln? We have some new data. We have some really interesting data, specifically about how poverty affects performance, sports performance. Steve is a proud, um, born and raised Lincolnite, except for a few months earlier in your life. We won't count those, but you are a Lincolnite and a 2015 graduate of the Riggs School. You know, he's currently working at Don't Panic Labs, but he spends most of his out-of-work uh, out time with <coughs> students, with athletes in our community as a high school coach and as a mentor and a volunteer with them. We recently heard about some of the work that Steve is doing, and we've engaged him here at the endowment to help us really get a sense of what the data is telling us about poverty and sports performance in our community. And so I'm excited to hear what he has to say. The only advice that I will give all of you is buckle up because he has a lot of information and um, this is gonna be an exciting bunch of information that he's gonna share with us. So thanks for being here, Steve. Awesome, thanks so much, Lori. Yeah, so with that, uh, we will uh, dive right in. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Thanks to uh, everyone attending here online. It's really exciting to have a lot of people uh, engaged on this issue that, as Lori said, is, uh, is, is pretty important to the, to the overall health and, uh, and state of our community. Um, my job here in this, uh, in this group is just gonna be to provide some, uh, some context and the lay of the land of uh, kind of what the data shows 
uh, in terms of uh, disparities and, and equities in youth sports uh, here in Lincoln. Um, most people, most Everyone on this call is probably generally aware uh, that opportunity and access to youth sports are impacted by various socioeconomic factors. So my goal uh, is to have us look at some of the data to show that yes, these disparities and inequities do exist and to give an idea of, uh, of how they do um, and in what ways uh, those disparities um, are, are, are visible. Um, and then I'm really excited to have uh, John and Johnny here to kind of help illustrate that data um, to show us what that looks like uh, at the day-to-day uh, ground level and then hopefully get into discussion of uh, what we can do about it. So uh, with that, we are going to dive in. I guess uh, first, just to preface things, um, we're going to look at some of the data that shows uh, that disparity in equity in, in, and inequity in youth sports does exist. Um, uh, in Nebraska uh, and here in Lincoln. We're going to start off with school sports um, for reasons I'll get into in a moment. Uh, this was uh, my intro kind of into this subject. Uh, as a high school coach, I noticed what's pretty apparent to most people um, that there's disparity in performance and outcome in high school sports uh, by uh, different socioeconomic factors uh, at a given school. Um, it's not terribly surprising anyone who's really within the vicinity uh, of high school sports probably has a general idea that this is occurring, but it's fascinating to map the data uh, and see these trends uh, laid out before us statistically. Um, so we're going to start with high school sports for two reasons. Uh, first, high school sports are a really good representation of who all in a community is participating uh, in a youth sport. Uh, everyone goes to school, uh, so it, the, the, the body of, of data, the sample size includes, uh, includes pretty much every uh, youth in the city. Uh, most students can participate. High school sports tend to be some of the relatively most accessible sports uh, by, by virtue of them being uh, free, facilities, coaches, equipment, the vast majority of that is, uh, uh, is provided. Um, and then everyone wants to participate. I think one of the really interesting things about high school sports in the state of Nebraska is that they're held in pretty high esteem. Uh, a lot of people want to play uh, sports for their school. Uh, even uh, the you know, highly competitive club sports and club leagues, which we'll talk which uh, I'll address in a little bit, uh, they, they usually pause their seasons so that, uh, so that even, uh, even youth participating in those opportunities have a chance to go play for their high school. So bottom line, high school does a really good job of encompassing uh, everyone that would like to participate in that sport and has the intent to do so. Uh, and the other reason is that school data is tracked really well. Uh, not just participation and performance data, uh, but demographics about the schools, so it's very easy for us to connect those two. Uh, and from that, from this full comprehensive data set, we can get a good picture uh, of uh, high school sport of, of school sports interest and performance and, uh, and draw good conclusions. So we're going to start at the statewide level um, and then uh, kind of zoom in on Lincoln. So uh, first piece that's going to be important off the top of the bat is free and reduced lunch. Uh, it is uh, if your household income is a certain percentage of the federal poverty level, you qualify. Uh, it's a pretty good indicator of general socioeconomic status at a given school um, and at, or this general socioeconomic situation of the demographics at a given school, and it's tracked universally across uh, every school in the state. Uh, so it's very helpful there from a from a data perspective. So. Uh, for each individual Class A sports season over the last 20 years, if you order the competing schools that season by their free and reduced lunch percentage, by the number of kids at that school who qualify for free and reduced lunch, uh, schools in the upper half, or sorry, schools, in, yeah, schools in the lower half uh, of these ratings on any given season uh, typically make up about three quarters of state qualifiers uh, for the state tournament in that given sport, or top eight finishers uh, at the state meet for sports that are uh, for sports that are like that. Um, and also, schools from this lower half, as you can see, win over eighty percent, or have taken home over the last twenty years over eighty percent of uh, of state titles. Um, in turn, uh, as you can see here, the upper half of these uh, um, of this order in any given sports season, uh, statistically over the past twenty years, has taken home just about a quarter of of, or sorry, just about 18% of state titles and has just been about a quarter of uh, state qualifiers or top eight finishers. Uh, you can break this down into quartiles, uh, even, uh, even more detailed. Um, and we can see how from here, uh, schools from the lowest quartile alone uh, take, have taken home over the past 20 years uh, nearly 60% of, uh, of state titles, which is a, uh, a far cry and is very far off from the, uh, the schools in the upper two uh, quartiles in that, uh, in that upper half. So obviously this varies by sport. This is aggregate information across all 18 uh, NSAA uh, major high school sports in the state of Nebraska. Uh, every, one, every individual sport has its individual pie charts like this with its ind individual distributions. But across all 18 class, sport, uh, class A sports, these, uh, these trends generally hold true. Uh, with a few exceptions, uh, boys basketball, boys track and field, and to some extent boys cross country are the only real exceptions. But across the board, 
uh, majority of sports uh, exhibit these, uh, these same trends. So this is just at the state level. Uh, if we go into uh, the regular season, for, for sports with a win-loss record, we can actually plot regular season performance versus poverty levels uh, at the given school. Um, and these are, these are two great examples here up on the screen in front of you uh, with baseball and girls soccer. Uh, very similar to the other sports that have a win-loss record um, in, uh, in the state of Nebraska. Uh, disparities appear here too. Uh, regular season performance looking at these two graphs in baseball and girls soccer seems to be meaningfully correlated with school poverty level relative to your competitors. And again, this is shared by the majority of other sports um, in, the, in the state of Nebraska. Um, so again, while the exact disparity varies, uh, nearly all Class A sports exhibit these general trends at both the state level and at the regular season level. Uh, lower poverty schools tend to perform better, and higher poverty schools tend to perform worse. Uh, an interesting note to add here is that nearly all girls' sports uh, are the ones exhibiting some of the most significant trends uh, in both of these areas. Uh, so that's just, an, uh, boys' sports are the only real exceptions uh, to this data. So uh, that's at the state level. What about here in Lincoln? Um, here are the current LPS uh, schools, the L six LPS high schools uh, free and reduced lunch percentages for the 21-22 school year. Uh, they fluctuate, but usually year to year, they're generally in this order and spread out relatively uh, to this degree. Um, if we look at the number of state titles that each, uh, each school has won over the past 20 years, uh, generally fits the trend, obviously. And then uh, the bar charts here on the right side, I find, uh, I find pretty fascinating. Uh, these are the percentages of seasons across all sports uh, over the past 20 years uh, that the school's teams have qualified for state or finished top eight at the state meet. And you can see, uh, the, you can see pretty stark uh, differences here. Um, it seems here that in Lincoln, there is significant disparity in high school sports outcomes by poverty levels, not just on the state level, uh, but here, um, uh, here in Lincoln. Uh, the same thing that we did with uh, earlier with uh, kind of taking a focused look at the regular season. Uh, we can do the same thing with those scatter plots that we looked at earlier and pick out just the LPS schools. Uh, these are two great examples here, uh, boys soccer and volleyball. Um, very, uh, very similar outcomes here. We see the same trends, uh, not just in these sports, but across all sports, both at the statewide level and zooming in uh, at the LPS level. Uh, obviously, at, at the Lincoln level, some of these trends are going to be a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker than at the state level. Uh, there are fewer schools. We have a little bit smaller sample size, but they generally match. Uh, the interesting thing about regular season performance is that obviously every team at every school is going to play different teams throughout the, uh, throughout the season. Their schedules and who they're matched up against, their level of competition is going to differ. And if anything, because these trends, even despite that, despite playing different teams every year, because these trends, both at the LPS level and at the state level, appear uh, in regular season performance despite that variation in competition, uh, that really says something and illustrates the significance um, of this data. Uh, so overall, uh, using from all this data, the, I guess the conclusion is using high school sports performance outcomes as a gauge, uh, there does seem to be pretty significant uh, disparity and inequality in youth sports, the state level and here in Lincoln. Uh, and poverty and socioeconomic status seems to affect young people's ability to perform uh, in those sports. Um, another data, uh, data item that we can uh, take a look at that, that uh, is a sign of disparity and inequality within youth sports, but also in turn kind of helps explain it, helps dive a little bit deeper as to why these disparities might exist, are, uh, per are also found at the school level, uh, participation numbers. Uh, these are pretty important indicators because before a student and a, and, a, and a kid gets a chance to perform in that sport in the first place, uh, before they're able to take advantage of that opportunity to any degree, they have to be able to participate in the first place. They have to have some access to an opportunity to participate in that sport in the first place. Um, and again, high High school sports generally some of the most accessible opportunities for youth sports participation, but we still see negative uh, these negative trends. Uh, once again, these are two great examples from LPS. Here uh, shows how um, we can basically uh, take LPS participation information. We can plot uh, tryout rates at each school. Um, versus, their, uh, versus the poverty levels of the school. So for example, uh, on the right side here, what percentage of girls uh, at, at the different LPS schools in each respective year tried out for, uh, for the softball team? Um, and we can see uh, that in, the, in these two sports and in the majority of LPS sports, uh, higher <coughs> poverty tends to be associated with a lower number of kids coming out for the sport in the first place. Uh, the different sports exhibit varying you know, medium to strong correlations, uh, but for, and some don't, don't uh, exhibit, sports, uh, exhibit those trends at all. There are a couple of exceptions, but by and large, across most LPS sports, uh, that trend of 
uh, higher poverty levels at a school associated with lower participation rates in sports uh, generally, uh, generally holds true. So overall here, by examining school sports as a whole, we can see that there seems to be disparity by poverty here in youth sports. And it's impacting not just performance outcomes, but kids' ability to participate in the first place. Now, these are just school sports, and there are obviously plenty of other opportunities outside of school for youth uh, in Lincoln to participate um, in, uh, in sports. So our question is, what do outcomes and participation rates and things like that look like uh, for all these other opportunities? The trick is, data on, uh, on all of those opportunities is a little bit difficult uh, to, to get our hands on. Uh, there are countless options uh, for participating in youth sports, and the info on, available on them varies uh, uh, to pretty significant degrees. Uh, however, with the information we do have, uh, we can get a sense of the disparities that likely exist broadly uh, across these avenues. Uh, and we can kind of separate these, uh, these opportunities uh, in kind of the public sphere into two main areas, uh, public sports and club sports, public meaning, uh, public leagues and offerings that are available uh, kind of openly to any team that would like to sign up and participate. Uh, and club sports, private organizations, uh, usually centered around uh, you know, long-term development and training around a specific sport. Uh, quick disclaimer, the slides that you're about to see are just very, it's, it's a very general overview of both of these areas. There are obviously plenty of exceptions to everything that you'll see on these two slides, uh, but this is generally um, a, a lay of the land of what this looks like here in Lincoln. Um, so we look at the public uh, youth sports in Lincoln. Uh, public sports generally, you know, seasonal public leagues, anywhere from you know a couple weeks at a time to a couple months at a time, uh, put on by uh, by uh, some great organizations at uh, YMCA, Parks and Rec, uh, Salvation Army, Small Fry Basketball. Uh, remember participating in that back in the day. Um, usually located in and around Lincoln against other Lincoln teams, uh, coached by volunteer coaches, commonly. Uh, uh, facilities use is often public facilities um, rented. Uh, one thing that uh, going through this data was, um, what I, I thought was, I, I thought was cool, and I appreciate about it was um, a lot of these public leagues set relatively minimal requirements for uh, like strict equipment requirements that you need to provide as to to implement as little overhead as possible uh, for folks to be able to participate. So, uh, and some of that equipment, like uniforms, uh, tends to be included with registration fees as well. Um, financial costs, obviously, it, it's highly dependent upon age, but you're usually looking at anywhere from you know 30 to 100 dollars maybe low three figures uh, for participation in each one of these leagues and you know a typical kid is, is you know would like to probably participate in those a couple times a year uh, club looks a little bit different obviously uh, usually for the offerings you're not looking at seasonal leagues but you're looking at year-long or at least extended seasonal uh, training uh, competitive development uh, over the course of the over the course of the whole year or long term uh, we've got multiple club organizations here in Lincoln across a lot of different sports obviously um, location uh, is is much different often competition often tends to be statewide regional um, even some national traveling teams uh, coaching is usually uh, Johnny and I were just talking about this earlier usually tends to be paid dedicated trained uh, coaches and staff around those coaches that are able to make that experience uh, very seamless that development experience very seamless uh, for young people. Um, uh, financial costs, this is you know one of the main points that, uh, that, that is probably pretty observable uh, from the outside. Uh, financial costs for club sports, usually a bit higher. Again, highly dependent on the age group and the level of competition and kind of the circuit that you know whatever your your competitive leagues you're playing in. Um, anywhere from hundreds to you know some club opportunities are upwards of two thousand dollars a year for uh, those high level, highly competitive kind of you know varsity level high school uh, athletes. Um, and it often doesn't include um, kind of some some added costs of uniforms, uh, tournament entry fees. Uh, to some extent, and then a lot of times those travel costs uh, are the responsibility of uh, families as well. Um, so this is a broad look at public sports and club and uh, club sports and just kind of the general landscape of youth sports offerings here in Lincoln. Um, just by looking at these, we can already see some emerging sources of disparity. Uh, plain and simple, at the club level, costs uh, are probably going to be a major obstacle uh, for a lot of families. Uh, not just the financial uh, costs, but the logistical costs of, of families being able um, to you know to travel and to participate in these uh, in these very competitive, very mobile. Uh, sports opportunities. Uh, that being said, within club sports, to be clear, you do get what you pay for. Typically, it's much higher quality coaching and development for the year round, or at least for the long term. Uh, better, uh, higher quality competition, uh, facilities, weekly team coordination. That's all handled instead of by you know one or two volunteer coaches by a, a an established organization. Um, but the the cost and logistical barriers uh, of accessing those benefits. Uh, Tend to make uh, tend to make opportunities like this inaccessible uh, to a lot of kids. 
Um, for public sports, we can pop back to that slide for just a moment. Um, public sports, not to say that this, uh, this area of youth sports participation isn't without its barriers as well. Um, it's generally more accessible cost-wise, but uh, it can have you know, barriers. It can be difficult to find and form a team, uh, depending on the communities uh, that you're a part of. Uh, volunteer coaches uh, are commonly in pretty short supply. Um, a lot of times it's you know, parents or, or related community members that, you know, frankly, step up to the plate and are willing to, uh, uh, to take time and resources to invest uh, in this group of young people, which is really cool. Uh, but a lot of that can kind of be in, uh, in short supply because that's on a volunteer basis. Uh, facilities use can often be pretty challenging uh, to coordinate. A lot of times public sports are using uh, public facilities um, on kind of a rental basis around Lincoln. Um, and those can be difficult uh, to line up for every single, uh, every single sports team, especially when rental costs uh, become involved. Uh, at least at the club level, all of this stuff is generally taken care of. Um, in, for public leagues like this, while the leagues are organized at a very formal basis, uh, uh, teams themselves are organized independently, and so that's where a lot of these barriers uh, come in. Um, and I'm really excited here to have John and Johnny here because they can uh, they can probably illustrate a lot better than I can what barriers and obstacles do exist in those areas. Um, so. Uh, as to kind of wrap up here, uh, the bottom line from this data is that a lot, there are a lot of potential obstacles that exist that affect young people's opportunity to participate in youth sports uh, in the first place. Um, and then, even if they can, even if an opportunity is available to them, uh, what that something ends up being, what that opportunity ends up being, its level, its quality of experience, is in addition impacted by these factors. Um, and the key here is all of this that I've talked about is all without addressing the deeper day-to-day -day challenges that affect kids' and families' ability to fully participate in these sports uh, in whatever experience they do end up having access to, uh, whatever that looks like. Um, so as I conclude here, that seems to sum it up pretty well. Uh, those seem to be the three main aspects of this disparity and inequality in youth sports. Uh, are there accessible opportunities to participate in the first place? Can I participate in the first place? What is that opportunity? What competitive level, what quality does that end up being that's accessible to me? And then once I have that opportunity, am I able to take full advantage of everything that experience has to offer uh, in the first place? Um, and youth and families uh, right here in Lincoln face challenges at a lot of these levels. Um, and the data we've looked at shows pretty clearly that there are issues here in Lincoln across uh, each one of these three uh, general categories. Youth sports opportunities aren't always accessible in the first place. Uh, limitations and barriers exist on what competitive levels and quality of experiences are available. Uh, even if they are accessible. Um, and then from uh, our data from the high school sports outcomes uh, and how they correlate with poverty and general socioeconomic status, uh, there seem to be facets of poverty that are obstacles for many youth to taking full advantage of these opportunities that they have access to uh, in the first place. Uh, so with that, I'm really looking forward to our discussion here and getting, uh, uh, getting John and Johnny's uh, perspective um, on what this looks like at the ground level, uh, how these disparities might exist and why they do, uh, and what we as a community might be able to do about them. So thanks, Lori. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Well, we promised you a lot of interesting data, and um, Steve delivered on that. I think this has given us a lot of food for thought. In many cases, it's provided us with new information. In some cases, it's only just solidified what we already knew. And I could tell you as a, as a former youth sports parent, um, I've received a number of, of emails uh, this week from people who are attending or wanted to attend this event who talked about their experiences and we're all very similar. We saw these trends, we see these trends happening um, and I think what we're hoping to do here is to think about how to address them and how to perhaps to bring some change around them. And one of the people that we want to hear talk about that is John Goodwin. John is a native of Chicago, but he has made Lincoln his home since 1996. He worked for the Lincoln Public Schools um, for 20 years, and then he transitioned to the Malone Center, the Malone Community Center in 2017, where he now serves as the director. He has brought many new services. I've had the privilege to work with John the last few years. He's brought mental health services. He's brought um, um, dance, reading, arts, crafts, chemistry clubs. He's brought all kinds of things to the Malone Center, but I can tell you one of his passions, and I know this, you won't, it won't take long for you to discover that one of John's passions is sports, and especially youth sports. He's been a coach um, and a mentor as well uh, to athletes. So he's gonna talk about his experience, not only what he's seen as a parent and a coach, but also what he's seeing now um, at the organization that he's served and the kids um, and families that he serves there. So, John. Thanks. 
Thanks, Lori. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, real quickly, um, I want to start off with a quick story to maybe wrap what I, what I want to say and, and maybe um, you all will be able to understand a little bit more. Sometimes sports is overlooked. Sports is not important, um, which I beg to differ. There was, a, as Lori said, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, there was a young man that, um, and I know he doesn't mind me telling this story, but there was a young man who uh, didn't grow up in the best environment. Um, there were gangs um, in the, the same facility of where he grew up. There were drugs. Uh, both parents was in the home, but the, the means was not there for uh, this young man to provide, um, to, to get the experience that he needed like other kids in the community. Um, there was a young man uh, from the Park District who reached out to this family to get this young man involved to be able to get into sports. What sports did for this young man was save his life. Um, those around him were dying uh, because they were not participating. They had a lot of idle time on their hands. And, and when, you have a, when a kid have a lot of idle time mm -hmm. and not being uh, active in different things, the activity becomes in the things that are not a, as leading them into the right path. The drugs, alcohol, gangs. Um, from that, this young man was saved because of sports. Sports saved his life. As of right now, this young man is 46 years old and you're looking at him. I am the one who was saved through sports. Um, from the opportunity of a, of a guy from the Park District who got me involved in sports to make sure that I did not get involved in gangs, get invo involved in drugs, alcohol, and all of the other things that I can get involved in. And, and I was able to make a transition from Chicago to here based on the fact that I had an opportunity, someone saw in me to hey, say, hey, you need to do something different. You need to do something productive. What, is, what, what are you good at? Oh, you can run the ball, you can catch. You can, you, can, you can run track, you can hit a baseball. Oh, you can try to attempt to swing a, a golf club. You're not as good, but there's other opportunities for you. What I'm, what, what I'm trying to get across is that if it was not for those experiences in my life, I would not be who I am today. As, I, as, I, as Lori said, yes, I am a director of the, the Malone Community Center. One thing that, that got me to where I am right now and that I fall back on are the things that I've learned through sports. People say, well, you can't learn, learn through sports. I've run the Malone Center. One of the, one of the main things I look at and, and I go back on is how can we move the Malone forward? Uh, in a positive and be more impactful in the community, I go back to my sport days. I go back to how uh, we were a team and, and the importance of teamwork, the collaboration of, of all of us from all different lives coming together for one particular goal is to move the ball down the field and to score touchdowns. I go back to how we have to, uh, the priorities have to be different and and, and, and how our priorities, we have to take responsibility and take ownership. And, and, and we begin to, the leadership skills that I have, I fall back on that coach that told me these particular things on what you can do to be successful. I learned that on the football field. I learned that, uh, yes, there's some things I learned in the classroom, but sports was a big part of my life. And it still is to this day. And one thing that I wanted to do, not just for the kids in the community, but also my own child, is to make sure that he has those same, same experiences to become successful. And so I had to work two to three jobs to make sure I can make that happen. I didn't have the means at the time to get him um, uh, involved in all of the sports. Why? Because all of these sports cost. They cost a lot. He, were in, he, were, he was in uh, uh, select football. He was in select baseball. He was in select basketball. I wanted to not rob him of those opportunities because I know that there's a gift inside of him that needs to be out, that needs to be represented, that needs to, to, to get out and, and, and showcase what he could do. The only way that I knew how was to say, you know what? I know what it did for me. 
I know how sports saved my life, and I know that people in the, my community sacrificed enough their time, their money, uh, their knowledge, their, their wisdom, all of those things that they did to sacrifice for me. So I said, I have to do it for somebody else. And if I can't do it for my own, which if it wasn't for myself and, and his mom at the time saying, look, we got to buckle down because bats and, and gloves and hotel expenses and, and, and using, being able to use the field and, and uniforms and shoes and, and, and footballs and, and, and again, uniforms because, because he was in multiple sports that I had to come up with another way to be able to support him and say, hey, okay, now, hey, is it me working two to three jobs? Yes, that's what I had to do. But he got that experience. And because of that experience, he's now playing Division I football. He's, his grades are now at a level to where he's academic Big Ten for the last two years. Why did that happen? And what he tells me is, if it wasn't for you all getting me into sports, Right, because he needed a way to be motivated to keep his grades up, to, 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 to go to class on time. All these different things added up. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do the same thing. I said, if it worked for him, if it worked for me, if anything works for me, it can work for anybody. So I decided to say, hey, we need these sports programs at the Malone Center. Why? Because I believe that if we offer a different experience, if we can get them those idle minds actively involved in something to where they can collaborate with others of their same age, uh, with the same goal, trying to reach the same thing, I think that would be a positive experience for these youth. So I said, let's do this. In order for them, in order for us to have positive outcomes, because outcomes are going to happen anyway. So in order for us to have positive outcomes, we need to first change or offer a different experience for these youth, right? So those experiences will form uh, their habits of thoughts, uh, their behaviors, and then their outcomes. Outcomes are gonna happen. So what if we, we, we dangle a carrot and change a different experience for them? So we, we started football program, we started basketball, volleyball. We started these programs track, now we have track. We are introducing soccer and golf baseball baseball why because we want to offer a different experience we want to get them involved in something and, and understand that teamwork is very important in moving forward because what 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 it did do for me is okay i need to learn how to work as a team i can't do this by myself who can i have why okay i need to get married one day we're going to have some kids Okay, we're gonna to have to be able to work together in this family. Teamwork, collaboration, leadership skills. Those are the things that we're teaching our youth at the Malone Center. Now, we use the sports as a carrot on the hook because we definitely, we know that everyone is not gonna make it to the NBA, NFL, the major league base. Everyone is not gonna be an Olympian, but what we do know that if we can teach them technology, if we can teach them coding on the back end, hey, you come to practice, we play these games, but you're gonna take 45 minutes to learn technology, coding, how, to, how does video games work? What are those different things that we can do to engage? We use sports as that. Will everybody make it professionally? I didn't, I wish I would have, but I didn't. So I had to use something else to be able to be successful. Now, when we talk about the, the expenses of the sports, they're very expensive. They're very expensive to try to get these kids to be able to participate like other kids in the community. So there's a lot of sacrifice that we have to make on our part. We don't make money on sports. We don't make money on, on children participating in different activities uh, uh, as far as our sports in the community. What we do is we lose money, actually. We, we, we lose uh, uh, some finances. Sometimes it comes out of our own pocket. Why? Because we don't want these kids to not have an opportunity for them to be successful. And we believe that, and I believe that sports is a great way to get everybody involved in, in, in what does success look like for them. Let's find the way of what that success look like for you through the sports that you play. That's building relationship, that's building trust, 
And those are things that we don't want to rob the kids of. A team, the kids that we serve, that team could be the only family that they have. We have to understand that some of the families that, that, we, that we're working with are broken. Some of the kids don't experience um, the love or the, uh, uh, the attention that they may have at home. So they come to these teams to build that. Oh, they build that trust. They, build, they get the love from the coaches, the love from the teammates. They get that, atten that attention that they're seeking at that time. No, we don't try to take the place of the parent, but we try to do our job to make sure that we're very impactful with the experiences to change how they're thinking, changing, changing their behavior, and hopefully we see more of a successful outcome. So what we run up against, and I know uh, I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up right now. So what we're running up against is, is field space, is, is where, where can we go for, for our kids that we're, serve, that we're serving uh, can go and participate and to practice. LPS has done, uh, I've met with LPS and they have really have helped here recently in, in offering discounts for us, which is great, which is great, but we're looking for, for more to be able to, we're serving a lot of kids in the community. What can we do uh, as, an, as an agency or who do we need to uh, collaborate with to give us more uh, advantages for our kids so we don't rob them from opportunities. Um, and so we look at fields, we look at uh, uh, different courts. Uh, it was mentioned basketball courts and, and baseball fields and soccer fields. We're looking for those things to where we're like, okay, where can we take them so they can have this, this same advantage, the same advantage and the same uh, uh, opportunities as everybody else, so we 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 have some we have some. Um, let me choose the word uh, the way I, I should choose it. We have some uh, obstacles that we're up against that we're trying to 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 try to figure out how can we make uh, more opportunity for our kids to be able to be successful. And we use the success that they're having, which they may not have never seen success before in their life or in their family. But if there's something, if it's just a free throw, we build on that and we can teach on the importance of the free throw. It may not be a, a 20 point average that you're getting, but if you're shooting that free throw to win the game, those free throws add up. So the importance of working together for one common goal is, is, is a life teaching experience. In every sport that we do, we teach them this, this, this right here, scoring touchdowns or getting a first down or make sure you're carrying the ball and not fumbling, those all translate to life experiences. Everything that you do in sports can be applied to your life and being successful. From the failures to the, to, to, and we don't call them failures, we call them learning experiences. When we fail, no, we don't fail, we learn. And so those are the things that we're trying to do for our youth. Um, so we add, so the main thing that I want, to, I want to really get across is the obstacles that we're facing. Um, spending the, the money on the uniforms. Uh, we've getting donations for that. People say, well, just give them this, just give them. Well, we want them all to look the same. We want them all to, be, to, to feel important. We go out of town and we go to different games. We don't need raggedy uniforms. We need, no, the, the, the best of uniforms. We want to look good. We want to play good, just like everybody else. These are just obstacles that we face. Um, uh, we need a field to play. We need, we need a, a, a basketball courts to practice on. Where can we go? What are some of the things? Our gym right now is, is very small. So what are some of the things that we can do? Some of the donors that we've seen in town, yes, they come to the rescue. This is what we can do for you. We love it. We love the, we, the collaboration. We love the excitement. We love the passion that, that people are now starting to see, hey, if we can do this for him, if we, we, how many lives are we saving? If it, were, if it have not been for the guy who helped me, I wouldn't be standing and sitting in front of you talking and we having this conversation. So if, if he can do it for me, I can do it for somebody else. You can do it for somebody else. You can do it for somebody else. If we come together as a city, 
If we come together, I don't care what part of the city, what part of the state that you're living in, if we come together and collaborate on this one cause of saying, hey, let's, let's work together to make sure that all of our kids in this community are experiencing what they need to experience to change the impact and the outcomes in the community and in their life. Wow. Um, I, I think that's very powerful. The idea that teams may be their only family, the way that your personal story, it all wove together. And um, we will be sure to put um, some contact information out to make sure that if people want to be part of this, um, they can do that. And I can attest that, that John Will um, is a great partner. Um, our last speaker is going to be equally impressive, I know. Uh, Johnny Grass is, Johnny is a, uh, played soccer for North Star High School. He was awarded, um, he had awards as the best defender uh, in the city of Lincoln. He continued to play soccer in college, and he's also been a soccer coach. So he's seen it on many levels. And I know, I saw you, your head shaking a lot when John was talking. Um, I have a feeling maybe you could, um, you, you can uh, really have experienced some of what he's talked about, but we want to hear it firsthand from you. So thank you for being here, Johnny. I thank, thank all of you guys. Um, as you guys can tell, just by hearing everybody's passion in, in this topic, um, and like John saying, you know, this was before I even went into high school, before Steve even went into high school. This is um, something that, a trend that we've noticed for years and years and years. Um, and so I'll just kind of start a little bit of more of the challenges and kind of how I've overcome the challenges and made them into benefits of the youth sports career that I had. And then as I explain that, I'll go into how I ended up coaching um, and kind of how my experience in the youth sports translates to what I teach my kids now and what I'm trying to teach them for the future. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like we've talked about, and if I do reiterate a couple of things, it's just because we are touching on a lot of the same things here. Um, it's going to be the cost. Um, I am one of three kids in my household. I want to say from probably the age of maybe first grade, we've always been on free and reduced lunch. So it wasn't like, you know, money fell from a tree in our backyard. So being one of three kids meant that when we played sports, everybody had a turn for sports. But for, so I mean, my brother was in basketball, soccer, football, wrestling, my sister did Volleyball, softball, basketball, soccer too. They were they were the they participated in multiple athletic um, sports. I was at at a certain age decided I'm just going to put all of my eggs in one basket and just stick with soccer, um, just because I was a person I I knew as a kid if I stuck my mind to something and I just one thing I could take it down every single time I'd give 100 percent effort and you would see it. Um, so just kind of knowing that. I couldn't ask, um, in some of the examples that Steve provided in um, his research, you know, some of those YMCA leagues were 30 to $100 depending on the age. And as we got into the club organizations where those are more private, those are going to be hundreds to $2,000. So as an 11-year-old kid, you're not going to ask your mom, can you play on this $2,000 team where you know your brother's going to be playing sports all year round and your sister's going to be playing sports all year round. So you kind of try and figure out a community where you can fit in and, and you know, make that work with what your social, um, or sorry, your, how, how the money comes in. And so you grow up playing with some teams where somebody's dad is the coach. And through my experience, um, I played with a team for three years. And right at the third year, he decided that his son, who was two years younger, was going to, they were going to break off and do another team and they were going to play the competitive league, which meant that my group, my age, we were stuck in the YMCA league. We weren't getting the extra exposure like the other kids were going to get. And so my mom took it out of her hands to contact people who she met in her, in her circles. That put me on a team where I was playing with kids two years older than me. And that was how I started to catch up on the skill gap with kids who my age were playing with these club teams and learning these different type of techniques. For me, what my take on it was is I'm going to help me get more physical, help me adjust to a game with older kids, kids who are moving faster. That way that I improve my game that way. 
Um, and in high school, that kind of happens. I was lucky enough, I made varsity very early. I didn't make it. I didn't take me multiple times to make the varsity team. Um, so again, I'm adjusting and playing with kids older than me um, and just trying to adjust the game that way. Kind of like John saying, soccer did, did play a big part in my life. Um, it, it got me away from kids who, I, I chose some good friends and some bad friends, I won't lie, but um, so sticking to soccer and going, hey, I have practice today, I can't go goof off, I can't go do this, it separated me from some stuff that ha have saved my life. Um, I was lucky enough also that some of the friends that I met um, while playing older than me, when they graduated high school, one or two of them went to college. And they were, hey, I have a guy named Johnny. You might be interested in him. He's, he's a good player. He's a good defender. You might want to look at him. And so I didn't know how to reach out to college coaches. I didn't know how to get my name out there in the college game. So having other people talk, tell their coaches about me was great because they did most of the work for me. Um, and so when I got to college, I learned so much more different things. I learned so much more about the game. Like I was telling Steve, it was touching the ball with one foot instead of the other foot. And how, to me, it didn't, to me that wasn't a big issue, but to coaches who have sat down and have worked hours and hours on how we want to move the ball and how we want to do things, that was different from what I received in high school. Um, or in, in growing up where it was just somebody's dad who just organized soccer, a soccer practice after work. And so um, just big, big changes like that in, in my game is why I said that the best way to give back to my community is to go back into coaching. Um, my substitute, I'm glad both of those pictures are the pictures that were used for my thing was because, so the picture on the left, that's a high school picture um, against a good friend of mine named Ben uh, East. And on the right side, that was my substitute for a club soccer. Um, I, again, couldn't afford paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for club soccer. So what I did was I, at 16 years old, joined a men's league out at Abbott on Sundays. And I mean, you can see the big smile on my face, playing with older guys and playing with adults, having to play much physical, more, more faster. Um, I wasn't a bench warmer. I was a guy who started from start to finish. And that big, big smile is, is all the hard work that I put into it that season getting first place in the league and winning the championship mm -hmm. that year. So mm -hmm. it was just, it was a big, big achievement knowing that I was able to overcome the hurdle of, I'm not gonna play for a club team, but I was still able to achieve so much more with the passion I had for the game and just being able to just go through it all in one motion, not have many hiccups down the road. Um, so again, that's kind of why I went into coaching was there was so much that I learned a different route that I didn't want those kids to suffer from not getting that opportunity. Um, there was a team I coached, the 06 um, Aztecs team. Um, that team was incredible, incredible. Um, I was fortunate enough that we were able to travel to Kansas City for games, Las Vegas for games, Minnesota for games. So being able to bring my type of knowledge, and at the time they weren't necessarily winning a whole lot, but when I jumped on board and I had these new ideas, we were starting to get results and it, it felt great knowing that my knowledge, my passion for the game would then translate to these kids. And it was just seeing myself and those kids, seeing the kids show up with basketball shorts to soccer practice, because the basketball shorts are $10 and the Adidas sh shorts at Shopco are $35. It's, it's an easy substitute because we got to pay for uniforms later and so forth. So it was just, that was the best way I knew to give back to my community was just, I, I don't want to, how do you say this, how do you say this? Um, I already put this, the footprints in the snow. So just walk in my footprints. You don't need to make your own path and suffer and dig deep into the snow. You can walk through my path and, and have it easier. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's, a, that's an overview. That's a deep, powerful overview of some of the experiences and the data that's happening in the community. I know we have questions coming in, but before I go any further, I just want to sum up a, a few thoughts. One is to say that um, Lincoln is such an incredible community, and we have, um, I know, people um, and organizations that want to be part of the work that you're doing. I know that 
Um, many of our, our sports programs offer opportunities for kids who need scholarships. I know the schools do those kinds of things as well. So there are opportunities to participate, but there are some things that are out of reach when you get to, to club sports and you do that kind of thing that may make it more difficult. And um, so our, our job here is to just examine the question and to think about what we can do um, to make it better. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to take some questions today and think about how we might do that. So, Morgan, can you let us know what the first question is? Okay, so the first question is, if we're involved with a club team or organization and want to be able to offer some financial assistance for kids that need it, what's the best way to identify and verify those individuals who need that help? Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. That's that's really interesting. I know that in in in, in this project that we're working on right now, I'm, again, we're kind of doing a general landscape survey of all the public opportunities and then a lot of the clubs. Um, and looking at information on uh, a lot of the club sports and club teams that are available for different sports around the city, there are a couple uh, that specifically do ask for uh, your free and reduced lunch status uh, within LPS, just because that's something that it's... It, I guess that, that's an easier way than, than asking for all that financial information. They just want to uh, verify your free and reduced lunch status. Uh, so that's, off the top of my head, that's an, easy, uh, that's an easy check that some clubs have already implemented. Um, Which is great, keeping in mind that that doesn't always take into consideration transportation. If you, right. have, a, if you, you, know, if you have a single uh, parent household, how you're going to be able to, to arrange getting kids to and from practices. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of things other than just getting it. But the idea of sponsoring kids to be participate yeah. in club sports is, I think, um, something that's certainly worthy of further discussion. Yeah. I'm sure you would welcome that among some of your kids at Malone. Yes, we definitely we, we take calls on. They actually call us to ask if we need any financial support for some of the kids that we have. And so we've been able, necessarily not able to happen to give them um, their finance, the family's financial information, mm -hmm. but we all we do is say yes, we do, um, because of our, our reputation and and those that and they see us in the community, that they they entrust us and what we do is give them you know a picture of the of the child if it's uh, okay with the parent, and um, give them a schedule of their games to even want to to come out and and support and to see you know what their money and their financial uh, support have done to uh, for that child I mean so we take those calls uh, we do identify a few that hey we do have some and they donate and we give them a schedule and there you go sometimes they want to meet them sometimes you know they don't they want to be private and that's how we've been handling them here for the last uh, six months Another thought that I'm having here, and this isn't necessarily specific to sports, but in a lot of um, a lot of different organizations I've been part of that have had some sort of offering for young people, um, the difference between what the, the 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 sticker price of the opportunity is, um, and then providing scholarships on the other side versus just lowering. Uh, that sticker price to be a little bit lower of a floor and kind of universal for, for everyone. Because I, I know there's uh, th there's research out there that has dove into this issue about what's uh, what what uh, tends to be more effective, um, setting that that standard price a little bit lower or setting a little bit higher so that the folks who are able to pay and and uh, and are able to um, uh, to, uh, to have those kind of resources um, can then you know effectively then help subsidize scholarships uh, and and uh, that kind of financial assistance for those who who can't make it. Um, but that's an interesting balance that I've. Uh, that There's I, that interesting research right around the world. Yeah. I, it's interesting to look around the world at what other countries do relative mm -hmm. to youth sports, and right. there's probably some lessons we could learn there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Is there another question, Morgan? Yes, we have a couple coming through. One is from the Belmont Community Center, and the question is if an organization has space, um, for example, a basketball court or a baseball field or just a field, how can they connect and offer those spaces to either the overflowing um, Malone teams, or how can they replicate what Malone is doing by hosting teams of their own? I think John will we grab have, at that opportunity. Right, we have a, uh, through support of, of CHE, they, very, they support us 
uh, tremendously with our sport. They believe in what we're doing. They believe in that idea uh, of giving back that way. We have, we definitely have an athletic director who schedules um, all of our events. Um, look, they, he, I was just talking to him yesterday that he looks, um, he, he makes phone calls to different schools, different organizations about their, uh, regarding their gym space um, availability, field space, uh, that availability. Um, I know North Star has um, helped us out quite a bit with their green space, not the turf, mm -hmm. <laughs> but their green space um, for our football teams last year, uh, which, which helped us tremendously. I know Abbott, it's not Abbott now, um, I forgot the name of it out yeah. there, but they, they help us tremendously, they support the Malone quite a bit with uh, basketball courts uh, and field use as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we were very grateful for that for that collaboration and partnership too. And but I, I, but if the Belmont Community Center has space, they could connect with you. And yes, if absolutely, if, definitely, definitely. Okay. We we will welcome that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I bet that's Emily um, mm -hmm. making that comment. It so is. thank you, Emily, for offering that. I think that would make a great collaboration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, can you describe some of the impacts of these disparities? And do you think that involvement in sports impacts graduation rates at all? I would love, just off the top, uh, one of the things that I'd still like to do with this big uh, school sports data set that I've got is to start correlating things like graduation rates and ACT scores and things like that. I think that would be really interesting. Again, I don't think that what we'd see would be necessarily all that surprising. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I think we all have a hunch that uh, sports performance and the general, you know, level of sports participation at a given school um, would probably, I mean, that, that's, that would be my, well, my I think hypothesis. both John and Johnny yeah. mentioned that it's one thing that kept them connected in school. Mm -hmm. They caused them to get their homework done because <coughs> there was some ramifications to their sports if they didn't do that. And so I, I'm thinking that that would seem like a correlation yeah. mm -hmm. that if you're involved in something that's meaningful to you and you want to continue doing yeah. that, that certainly your grades would be um, uh, impacted by that. Yeah. But I think that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I do want to go back to the question or the comment I made earlier because I, I know I've mentioned this already, but I think it is incredibly important. And that is the ability for kids who um, are, say, in your programs at Malone or or coming to Malone, or for you, Johnny, to be able to get to know kids from other parts of the community, mm -hmm. to get to know parents from other parts of the community, to have kind of a much broader network of people. I would also think that that is got to be helpful as you look for references for jobs, as you're looking for um, just uh, understanding the broader sense of what the world can be, opening up opportunities for you, um, uh, you know, really expanding your horizons, so to speak. So I think that networking piece I keep going back to is something that's kind of hard to define, but has to be incredibly important. I bet, Johnny, you got to know a lot more people than, than you maybe would have otherwise because of your experiences. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have stories where um, I would come to games and my mom would go, oh, Johnny's here, who is he? And then it's, hey, what time do you play? 6.30. Okay, what team are you on? You know, are you on my team or the other team? Mm -hmm. And it was, mm -hmm. oh, you're you're on my team. Okay, good, good. So I was starting when you play in Lincoln for a long time too. You kind of know the teams and you kind of know the players throughout the years. And it's, hey, I recognize that guy. Hey, I recognize that guy. Mm -hmm. And um, as kids, we're we're talkative, we're social. It's a simple, hey, you know. How does your team work? Or hey, how does your how is your coach compared to my coach kind of thing? And then you hang out at their house, which is maybe a family you wouldn't know, or, or they'd have you over for dinner or whatever. I mean, it's a whole yeah. Yeah. building and network that's going to serve you well, and you mm -hmm. probably still know some of those who used to be kids, but they're now adults yeah. like you, right? Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And these and these benefits of sports, like like these who've talked about, you know, we have, you know, it, it has a positive effect on grades and the, and uh, you know, keeping out of other opportunities that might be a little bit uh, a little bit less beneficial. And those are the tangible pieces, but there are so many intangibles yeah. to yeah. participating in sports and having some sort of community that you are pursuing a common goal with, like mm -hmm. John, like you talked about. Like it's 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 very formative uh, to any yeah. kids experience. Another question here. This one's 
um, interesting to think about, but how can we include refugees and immigrant children in sports since there's a gap concerning their ability to attend games in the city because of financial problems, then also just being new to many of the types of sports that may not mm -hmm. be available in their country of origin? Well, I know your director is working with some of the mm -hmm. other ethnic centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He's working with all, he's, he's trying to get all the cultural centers together here in Lincoln uh, to be able to offer that experience. We're, we've been very intentional about uh, reaching out to as many people as possible in the community uh, to get uh, everyone involved in all sports. Um, and, and it's something, you, you mentioned refugees, but I, I'm, I'm talking all nationalities uh, to be introduced to all sports. Sometimes for, for us, we, we just pick up a basketball and think that's no. What about soccer? What about golf? I mean, high school, I mean, colleges are giving scholarships away for golf. And I wish I would have <laughs> took that a little bit more seriously, but it's hard to find a golf course where I was at. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, getting there. Um, so, but it, it's like, man, can I go back and, and, and learn the game of golf so I can get a scholarship? That's one of those deals. I mean, so they just have to be introduced to it. Um, you, inter you are introduced to what's around you not going out the box because all you see, if all you see is basketball, that's all you're going to do. I mean, so our job is to introduce everyone in the community with all sports, if that be soccer, if that's swimming, if that's golf, if that's tennis, to make sure that, hey, what do you, what do you like? What do you gravitate to? And then we build from there. So we, we welcome all nationalities uh, to be able to, uh, again, work together because that's, again, you replace, you replace ignorance with knowledge and we're all learning from each other and it's, it's funny I mean Lori mentioned going to someone's house and you talking from a guy from Chicago I'm going to eat on the farm I've never been on the farm before and I'm taking my kids because my son played baseball with all everybody I mean from I've never heard of places in Nebraska that so I'm driving like okay I hope I'm, I don't make the right the wrong turn but I end up in a spot where there's just cows and dogs and and, and cats you know, and, and I'm just like, what, what? But we all got along. They learned my experiences from Chicago. I learned how they were raised on the farm. That's just building relationships. And, and, and again, replacing the ignorance with knowledge of who people really are and what we can do together as a, as a community. Mm -hmm. So another comment here, this one's interesting. Um, this person says the win-loss rate's painful to watch and can't help the morale of high school athletes that attend high schools with a large population of free and reduced lunch students. Is there anything that NSAA can do to change how schools schedule games until we can get this thing figured out? Well, certainly, I mean, those are the kind of policy questions that as a I, very think, good question. I think as Steve yeah. continues his work, mm -hmm. and I would, what I would hope is that all of you um, will have a chance not only to get a recording of this, um, we'll send it out so that you can share it. I think that's a way to keep the conversation going. But um, Steve's work is to compile all of this information into a report and then also use it as a way to change policy. So those are the kinds of things we don't know the answer to today, unless one of you do. But I think what we're saying is that we would then be able to use this document as a way to, to really create thoughtful policy discussions. All right, we have a few more questions here that are interesting that I would like to get to. I would like to note, though, it is past one, so if you have to log off, feel free. This webinar is recorded, so you can come back and catch the questions that you missed. I, we appreciate all this discussion. So this one question, it says, with the data Steve presented, how can we as a community begin to change the connection between lower participation rates and socioeconomic status in high school sports? Is the lack of participation connected to the lack of opportunity for youth sports pre-high school? That is a really good question. I can't speak necessarily to, I mean, we're still gathering data on, on the general access to sports before the high school level. Um, I can tell you that as a high school coach, uh, I have seen a lot of these uh, barriers to participation from teams that I have coached. I've had over the course of the season, um, 
you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, academic uh, issues, which obviously stem from much, uh, from, you know, much, m many more background factors. Um, I've had kids who uh, can't make practices all the time because they have to watch siblings because their parents are working, um, are, are working jobs. Um, when, we, uh, when we've had seasons where we've had to practice off-site, uh, I've had kids on my team who can't make it out to practice every day because they do not have a car. Um, and they can't get themselves there. Um, uh, the ideal would be carpooling there, but obviously in the high school social uh, dynamic, just approaching people uh, kind of vulnerably and explaining situations and asking them for rides and things uh, can be a little bit challenging. Um, had, you know, you run into, when as, as a coach, I run into a lot of those factors that are simply uh, obstacles to participation uh, for those kids that unfortunately, and it pains me that as a coach, you know, I, I, I try to do what I can uh, structurally to schedule our practices and, and make this opportunity as accessible as possible. But, you know, some things are just those background uh, factors that uh, I don't have much control over and I can't change, and that's really hard. But, you know, I, you know, I also think this is a product of um, investing in other people. <laughs> you know, and um, the, the pandemic didn't help in this regard. I think we, we probably withdrew a little bit more, created our smaller circle around us. but. And I'll speak from a broader, broader context. When we look at a lot of the health issues facing the community, a lot of it could be solved or at least made major progress toward if we, if we were willing to invest in other people. And sometimes, you know, I get it. I mean, we all want to make sure that our, our group is, is um, um, our IBE, so to speak, is well cared for and has great opportunities. But sometimes when you're watching and you see other kids not be able to participate, I think at some point at a, as a community, it's just about stepping up and doing something. Being willing to say, this is part of our responsibility as a fellow citizen of this community that we live in. Now, I know that's broad and, and it's hard to get our hands around and there's a lot of organizations that are really trying to do that, but some of it, it can't be left all to the schools. It can't be left all to nonprofit organizations. Some of it is just individuals in this community that are willing to step up and make a difference for another kid who's not gonna have that chance. And we've got to move back in that direction, I think, mm -hmm. as a society. So going off of that, Lori, if someone does know a child or is working with a child who wants to play and compete but needs financial assistance or any other type of assistance, how do they find the best contact to help? Well, it's a, it's yeah. a, a bit of a, um, a sad ending to our presentation that we're all sitting here going, we're not sure what the answer to how to help a kid is. It really puts but, in a nutshell this whole conversation. But here, I, yeah. think, I think reaching out to um, trusted adults in the school, mm -hmm. reaching out to folks at the Y, reaching out to people like John and his staff, reaching out to folks <laughs> at, um, uh, at the cultural centers who you're working with, if, if that's appropriate, beginning the conversation of how do we get kids who want to participate and really invest in this part of um, their life experience, how do we give them a chance to do that? And that's what we're really here to talk about. And, and I think that question right there is something we have to make sure that we address in this report. Right. Where Absolutely. is that place where we yep. can begin for so many kids? Yep. The why is certainly a place where a lot of kids have opportunities. Um, and, and so there are places, but we want to make sure that the question is easier to answer than it just was. Mm -hmm. So, I think we will wrap it up with that. I mean, I know there's more questions. Um, feel free to continue the dialogue, send the questions to us, we will send them forward. But I want to take a moment to thank three people who have, I think, informed us greatly this afternoon. Johnny, your story, um, you know, any lived experience is going to help us understand better. And so thank you for doing it. I know this was maybe a, a nervous thing for you, oh, but yeah. you did awesome. So <laughs> thank you. And thank you to... And, and John, you know that I appreciate so much of what you do, your story, your power, full telling of that story, and the work you're doing. You're doing amazing things over there. The pictures are just, um, you know, show what great things are happening. Mm -hmm. And Steve, I appreciate your mind and that, that ability mm -hmm. to take information and just mm -hmm. make um, sense of it all in the mm -hmm. stories that it tells. And to Morgan, thank you, and to Michaela in my office, who did such a great job organizing this event, and to all of you who had an interest in it. The next question is, how do we keep this dialogue going? How do we make change? And we want you to be part of that, uh, uh, of that story. And so thank you for being, this is the first step. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Have a great day, everyone.